person beside you, just say welcome. I mean, do it in a kind, in a very nice way. <laughs> okay. Um, to start this meeting, we would like to do an opening prayer, and that will be the second stanza of the national anthem. Shall we rise? together for ourselves. Please be seated. Right now, I'm going to call on the, uh, to the high table, some distinguished ladies and gentlemen that we have in our midst who will be taking part in the activity and event today. Permit me to welcome uh, the chairman of this event of this public lecture uh, in person of Mr. Sam Ewer. He is a nutritionist and a dietitian, a fellow nutrition, a fellow at the Nutrition Society of Nigeria, also a fellow at the Institute for Dietitians in Nigeria, former senior research fellow and director at National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. He is a public policy consultant Consulting on food and nutrition, security, and rural development. Please kindly welcome Mr. Sam Yua to the high table. You can do better, please. Let's clap for him as he comes up. The next person I'd like to invite to the high table is the person of Professor Wasiu Afalabi, the president of the Nutrition Society of Nigeria. Shall we please welcome him to the high table? You're welcome, sir. Please, let's give him a more round of applause, please, as he comes up. Thank you. Next to that is the Deputy Director, Food and Nutrition, Federal Ministry of Budgets and National Planning, Mrs. Nelson. Is she around? Not yet around. Okay. Uh, when she comes, we invite her to the high table. We'd like to invite our guest speaker, Mr. Adebo Wale Onofawora. Please, shall we put our hands together for him as well, as he comes up? Mr. Adebo Wale Onofawora is an MD and CEO of Big Farms. You're welcome, sir. Please, let's, let's, let's keep clapping. Let's keep clapping as he comes up. Let's keep clapping. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Then we also have another, another guest speaker. We have Dr. Shelley Isi Hejo, also the coordinator at um, Kids Nutri Garden Vacation School. Shall we put our hands together for her, please? Okay. Thank you. Hello? Okay. I will also
Hello? Yes, I'd like to recognize the, and call on the high table, the immediate past president of the Nutrition Society of Nigeria, and also the project lead for Project Enan. So you can see Project Enan there, Engaged Nutrition Academia in Nigeria. Uh, for this project, we have Dr. B.I.C. Bry. Please, let's put our hands together for him as he comes up. Okay. Thank you. So right now, we would like to call for goodwill messages. So this meeting is put together by the National Society of Nigeria as well as the Federal Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning. We've been working together with a lot of partners uh, on this project and several other projects. And then, so we would just like a representative from each of these organizations to please uh, come up for their good message. So I'm going to start with CS Sun. Do we have the representative of CS Sun? Please let's put our hands together for her, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jane Arinze Egemonye. I'm representing CSON. CSON is Civil Society Scaling Up Nutrition in Nigeria. So um, for CSON, we've been working with um, NSN and um, other members um, of the team planning the new Nigerian Nutrition Week. And we're excited that we're here at the moment. Thank you so much for um, your partnership. Thank you for your collaboration. Um, it is important to know that um, CSON, a coalition of civil society organizations, have presence in communities, states, and also at the national. Some of the things we have been doing over the past years um, in terms of improving nutrition um, in, the, um, in Nigeria is we have We've had um, household economy trainings. We've also had food demonstration um, at different primary health centers. And we have supported um, community mobilization and sensitization at various levels. So this is something that we take to heart, ensuring that every citizen in Nigeria is food and nutrition secured. We are not leaving anybody out this and as much as possible we are seeing how we can bring everybody together to foster um, a nutrition support um, Nigeria. So on behalf of CSON we wish everyone a fruitful uh, meeting, deliberation, discussions and we hope that at the end of this day everybody will take something back with them. For us to change the, the situation, food and nutrition situation in Nigeria, it has to do with every one of us. We have to learn, we have to take action in our own little way. And if we don't do this, we have to live the life that we preach. And so as advocates, as civil societies, as members of civil society organizations or professional associations, we want to ensure that we learn and also use what we have learned, take action, and also spread the word um, in our communities. We wish us free for and uh, we hope that we take something out of this lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. CSON is doing quite a lot of work in the communities, and so we really appreciate it for all you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, before I continue, I'd like to emphasize that please kindly use your nose mask, and if you have your personal sanitizer, you can as well use that, but we also have provisional sanitizers around uh, that you can make use of. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to call on the representatives of Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Do we have representatives of GAIN around? Not here, okay. Uh, do we have the representatives of Harvest Plus around? Harvest Plus, okay. Ministry of Information, thank you very much. Please can we put our hands together for him, please. Uh, 
Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Christopher Domi. On behalf of uh, Federal Ministry of Information and Culture, we are happy to be partners on, with nutrition and um, based on what we see in the struggle to make Nigeria free from malnutrition, we in the ministry have decided to go on a full-blown campaign from starting from January towards the end to see how we can also contribute our own quarter in order to synthesize, educate, and enlighten the Nigerian populace on the danger of malnutrition. We are happy to be here and I believe that most of the things we are going to learn here today will aid, even aid us to know what to do during our campaign next year. So we wish every one of us a fruitful deliberation. Thank you. much. Do we now have the representatives of Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, Mrs. or Ms. Joyce? Okay, also not here yet. Uh, UNICEF, do we have the representative of UNICEF here? Okay, please let's put our hands together for her, please, as she comes up. Aves plus you are next, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I'd like to crave your indulgence um, and your understanding. Um, I have a sore throat, so I might not be as audible as I would ordinarily be. Um, my name is Nkiru Kaimwelum, and I work with um, the UNICEF country office here in Abuja. Um, and I would just like to stand here and to congratulate um, and appreciate the leadership of the Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning, and the Nutrition Society of Nigeria for convening and leading on this um, Nutrition Week 2021. And I would also just like to congratulate uh, late, um, every one of us for taking time to be here. It's important for us to continue to amplify the nutrition message in Nigeria. It's important for us to have these types of meetings to be able to meet and um, to have discussions about how to advance the nutrition agenda um, in Nigeria. So it is on this basis that um, I want to bring you good will from um, the UNICEF country office here in Nigeria and also the general UN system to say that um, UNICEF is a key partner of the government um, in improving nutrition for women and for children and um, we're with you all the way and we wish you very successful deliberations um, in this public lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I'd like to call on uh, Mrs. Kalejai from Harvest Plus to please give the goodwill message from Harvest Plus. Please let's put our hands together for her as she comes up. Thank you. I'd like 
to say good morning, everyone, and uh, that I am happy to be here today. I bring God's uh, good tidings, good will messages from the Harvest Plus Nigeria Country Office, and uh, we want to say that we are happy to associate with uh, this um, uh, forum today. Um, yes, it is important for us to meet, and we are, at least there is a week that gives so much focus to nutrition and um, especially in terms of the changes that uh, we are experiencing every, everywhere in terms of food systems especially so i wish us um, a good deliberation and i hope that by the time we leave here we'll have new ideas and new concepts that will help us in doing in uh, discharging our duties and bringing better nutrition to women and children especially in nigeria Thank you so much, and I wish you a Thank you very much, RS Plus. So, we would like to move straight to... Uh, we'll move to the, the lecture. But before then, I'd also like to find out, do we have representatives of Ministry of Health and Federal Ministry of Agriculture here in the, in the hall? Do we have representatives from Federal Ministry of Health and Federal Ministry of Agriculture? None. Okay. So I jumped the gun. <laughs> okay, please. Um, I'd like to call on the president of the Nutrition Society of Nigeria to do a welcome remark to everybody. Please let's welcome Professor Wasiwa Falabi. Thank you. Good morning to you all, distinguished gentlemen and ladies. I feel highly delighted to welcome you all to this public lecture, which is a major component of the celebration of the 2021 Nigerian Nutrition Week. It was exactly about uh, seven years ago that the Nutrition Week was mooted to be celebrated on an annual basis. And since that time, the Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, then the Coordinating Ministry for nutrition activities in the country has been in the forefront working closely with the Nutrition Society of Nigeria, the prime mover of the annual celebration. For this year, the theme for the week is full system transformation for healthy diets and nutrition. And you will all recall that that theme also featured prominently in our 2021 scientific conference and annual meeting of the society held in Enugu, held in, Enugu in September. And the reason is very simple. All over the world, we know that malnutrition has become a very serious problem and a great concern to many countries, including Nigeria. And the world 
is moving forward to address the challenges of hunger and malnutrition through the transformation of the totality of food systems. And there were various dialogues that were had all over the country. Coming out of the dialogue, Nigeria government decided that one of the best ways for us to tackle the issue of malnutrition and ensure um, improvement in nutrition in disease is to boost food security and nutrition through what they call Operation Feed Yourself. And there are some components of that Operation Feed Yourself. And one important thing there is the promotion of homestead gardens particularly by individuals and schools. This is the government of Iran is going to put on homestead gardening by individuals and schools to tackle the issue of malnutrition. Be part and parcel of the dialogues that was heard across the country, we thought that how can we, as a nation or as a society, also make our contribution to that response? And so it was on that note that the society. So it was on that note that the society, through the council, decided that for this year's public lecture, we are going to be addressing the issue of homestead gardening. The public lecture is not just coming from the blues. The Nutrition Society of Nigeria, through Project Enan, that was mentioned earlier by the moderator engaging nutrition academia in Nigeria in the nutrition agenda. We had a public lecture in 2020 which looked at the issue of adolescent nutrition in Nigeria. So for this year, it is innovations in home garden. So, The society is particularly uh, grateful and will like to appreciate once again the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who has been supporting the society in implementing the project ENA. So today's event is ably supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I would like to congratulate the Federal Ministry of Budget and Finance, Budget and National Planning for keeping the flag flying and particularly recognize the immense work of the director in the Food and Nutrition Unit of that ministry, Mrs. Chito Nelson, as well as other members of our team. I will also like to thank and appreciate other stakeholders that have been supporting this initiative, particularly Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, Nutrition International, CSON, and the World Bank. I would like to implore that we see them listing, as I believe that the person who has been invited to come and speak to us is a guru in home gardening business. And many of us, apart from the fact that we can get adequate nutrition through any diets, 
using the home garden approach. It can also be an income hand for many of us. The challenges of the challenges of not having land is out of the place now. I won't preempt the guest lecturer, but I want to once again um, welcome you all, ask you to say that pay attention and listen attentively. I wish all of us a fruitful public lecture today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the President. Uh, before we go ahead, uh, while the President was talking, the Deputy Director for Food and Nutrition, Federal Ministry of Budget and National Planning came in. Please, ma, we would like to invite you to the high table, Mrs. Nelson. Can we put our heads together for her, please? Please, let's, let's, let's put our hands together for her, please. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, as we continue in this meeting, I'd like to invite Dr. Lua Shiwa Rio to read a citation of our guest speaker, Dr. Rio. Thank you. I want to start with the existing protocol. Here yeah, I present Mr. Debo Wale or Nafawura, popularly called Debo. He is a social entrepreneur with expertise in agri business and uh, value chain development. And he has been doing this for more than 17 years. He is the manage managing director and chief executive officer of Big Farms Concepts, a company he founded in year 2006. In year 2014, he also co-founded I2510 Limited, a company that processed and packaged NAVDAC certified locally grown foods for entrepreneurs to resell. He was managing director of the company until 2016. Mr. Debo originally trained as a quantity surveyor and ventured into agripreneurship, a field he was introduced to and trained on by his father throughout his growing years. To build his capacity in this area, he has attended several courses on aquaculture from Sogai Center, Benin Republic, commercial hydroponics. Technology Farming from Hydroponic Academy, Cape Town, South Africa. Osfam with an Enterprise Development Training at EDC of Pan Antarctic University, Lagos, and several other trainings and conferences, both online and offline. He innovated and developed the first localized biofilter for recirculating aquaculture system from puny stone and crates in order to produce high quality catfish and tilapia fingerlings, fingerlings and juveniles cheaply in the year 2003. The technology has since been passed on to more than 200 individuals. He also pioneered commercial hydroponics technology farming in Nigeria. Mr. Debo also went on to offer consultancy services to higher institutions of learning. He established and managed Afe Babalala University Adokiti Farms, Moringa Projects, the largest of such in West Africa, as well as the university phase 2,500 capacity fish farm projects. He served as the managing consultant, managing consultant to Landmark University Commercial Farm and project lead consultant to the Landmark University Hydroponic Technology from year two. 2017 to date. Currently under the boss king leadership, Bike Farms Concepts has collaborated with Landmark University to become the first university in Nigeria to set up 
a greenhouse and hydroponic technology center where students, staff, and others are regularly trained on hydroponics and greenhouse farming. Mr. Adebo is a passionate teacher, a UK certified transformational coach, trainer, and author. He has trained over 15,000 individuals in the last seven years across Africa in soilless farming, aquaculture, processing of different agro products, and so on. He and three other Ashoka Fellows in Africa were sponsored by Burenga Igel Im in Germany to train about 70 thought leaders from Bungoma country, Kenya, as a training of trainer program from August 2021 to October 2021. With this training, the Bungoma people are currently solving their peculiar problems by themselves. He is a certified professional enterprise manager, fellow of the Institute of Agribusiness Management, fellow of the African Institute of Enterprise Development and Management, and an Ashoka Global Fellow. His company, Bike Farm Concept, was the recipient of the 2019 UN-supported African Child Prize for Agriculture. In 2019, he received the award of SME Tech from the Association for Small and Medium Business Owners of Nigeria. His company was one of the just 10 companies nominated in Ogun State by the Ministry of Commerce and Industry for the Federal Government 2020 Award of Excellence in Industry and Productivity. In October 2021, Debo became one of the only 12 green skill winners in the world by an HSBC and an LB of Meaningful Business 2021 winner. He has a burning goal of raising 100,000 agripreneurs across Africa by 2025. And he is currently reinventing agriculture and raising a new generation of farmers in Africa. With a very rising deliver today's public lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Adebo Onofora. Adebo Wale Onofora. You are welcome. Thank you very much. So I would like to appreciate God Almighty and organizers of this program. I'd like to uh, recognize the chairman, Mr. Sam Yua, the president of the Nutrition Society of Nigeria, Professor Wasigo Afalabi. I want to appreciate you, sir. I want to appreciate every dignitary here from the development agencies, from the ministries, from all over the country. Thank you for the privilege to be bringing this presentation. Actually, when Prof called me, I think it was around 10, 10 years, me the team, and the focus of this program. I was actually surprised. Um, let me also say, I wasn't startled because in the last seven years, by the special grace of God, this has been a recurrent theme around the work that BIC farms have been focused on. So I want to thank you for seeing us worthy to bring this to you. Let me say, I am not an academia. So my presentation mostly is not academic in nature. And I want to believe the society are actually looking for an academic presentation. But uh, I'm a down to art person. I try to make my presentation very simple and then 
straight to the point. I use a lot of pictures because I believe a single picture can actually express a thousand words. And um, with some of the pictures, you get to see what's happening in Nigeria uh, and not just things that are happening outside this plan. But what we've been doing and quite a lot of people around have been doing. The theme of this event is fostering innovation in home gardening for sustainable healthy diet in the Nigerian household. Sometimes in 2016, Professor Adebowale, he shares my name, came to my office and said, I saw some of your programs and I think we can collaborate. We should start school gardens. And then this can lead to a lot of things. Anyway, he, and I remember he told me that he started it in the U.S. He had been living in the U.S. for more than 18 years. And that through the school garden, he was able to establish a particular fact that if you eat vegetable to a particular quantity every day, you will not visit the hospital. And I remember he said, most of the health challenges in Nigeria were because our primary health uh, system is not functioning well. And some of the things we are actually tackling with drugs are meant to be nutrition in nature. So that also gave more value and reason to the work we are doing. And um, I want to appreciate God that organizations like the NSN can... Uh, see what we are doing and believe we can talk to you today. BIC Farms, actually our vision is empowering Africa to feed herself and the entire world. Uh, let me just paint this picture. If I'm a scout and I have the privilege to pick somebody here for a basketball court or a basketball team in America, who do you think I will consider first? Pardon? The tallest person. Thank you very much, sir. Now, what he just said tells us that height means potential for basketball. Now, we have several continents on earth. And one of, that, of these several continents actually have over 50% of the arable land. So, I tell people, we don't need a prophet. We don't need an alpha. We don't need a seer. To tell us that that continent was created by God to feed the world. And that continent is actually Africa. So if we are not only feeding the world, if we are the poverty headquarters of the world, and poverty is measured in hunger, you know, it means that it's a big problem. So the vision of BIC is to make sure that Africa can feed Africa. And Africa must feed the world. And because of that, our mission has been of business problems around specifically these platforms, hydroponics and aquaponics technology, aquaculture, and then agribusiness value chain. So now, back to our subject, home gardening. Traditionally, the cultivation of a small portion of land around our houses or at the backyard, usually within a walking distance from the house, in order to meet the household dietary and nutritional needs. While I was growing up, um, okay, four years ago on my father's birthday, I wrote something on my Facebook page. I said, while growing up, I hated my father so much. And for one simple reason, he retired from Malawi University, University. You know, he comes home most days around 4.30 p.m. Anytime myself and my siblings hear that ping ping at the gate, we lose our peace. Because my father will get to the house in 15 minutes, 30 minutes at most. He will have changed his clothes. And the word is Ebami uh, For those who are not Yoruba, he will say, Meet me at the backyard. At that backyard, we will work on the farm till around 7, 7.30. And this is, uh, that has been our daily protocol. 
So I dreaded it. I ate it. When friends are talking about football after school, at home and all that, my own father is go to the farm. Go to the farm. That's 2016. I read the message from Steve Jobs and he said the duct of life is connected backward, not forward. And I looked back and I knelt down and I said, thank you, Daddy, for taking us by force through that process. Because everything I've been doing in the last 17 years, originally I didn't go to a formal school to learn them. I studied quantity surveying. And I'm a farmer today. In 2006, I went for a training at Songhai. We all hear about Songhai. I went for a two-week training. By the third day, I became the facilitator. Because the people I went to learn from started learning from me. I, I just discovered, oh, what I thought I could pick from them. Anyway, they engaged me throughout. So, and things like this now made me to understand, wow, my father, my mom deposited a lot in us. We didn't know. We didn't understand. I graduated in 2002, worked for just a month. I didn't enjoy it, and I was asked, what would you like to do? I said, let's experiment with farming. That was how I got into farming, February 2003, and I've never looked back since then. I've been doing that, and God had been good. Farming had taken me to several parts of the world different places including this place today so you can imagine even when i didn't know it meant anything the home garden that was introduced to just like that poultry fisheries there is this particular vegetable called a foibo i don't know if you know it Igbo is garden egg those days we used to be the largest producer of a foibo at olabison obanjo university they wait every friday for us to bring our vegetable to campus. People pay ahead to buy it. You know, I didn't know I was being given the future. <laughs> but look at it today. So home garden, it is not just something you talk about. I've experienced it and it's, it's much. That backyard, that sidewalk can actually be something big. So home garden also is a farming system traditionally deployed for the cultivation of staples and some essential food for family consumption and the household of people around such household. Now, the question is this. Why food? This German philosopher made a statement. He said, food is the beginning of them. He said, before anything can go into your mind, you must first have something in your stomach. And you will agree with me. In fact, I said, this statement uh, preempted the stomach infrastructure slang in Nigeria. <laughs> you know? So as somebody said, an hungry man is an angry man. So food is key. Now, why? Why home garden? That's the question. Consumption of fruit and vegetables in Nigeria really are far below the WHO recommendations of 12 kg per capita per month about 400 grams per day. Uh, air, averagely we consume about 5.93 kg. That was said by Rebecca Ibe at all. You can just imagine that simple statement. But it's big. This is one major reason why some of the things that are happening around here have been there. We are not even consuming half of the recommendation. Now, another reason for home gardening is the need for more to meet our requirement. Now, with what is consumed in Nigeria, you will be shocked to know that if we are to actually meet what is required, in 30 years, Nigeria will need almost about 30 million hectares of additional land. To be able to mean that currently we have the largest arable land in the world, about 84 million hectares. If that is engaged, you will be sure that it cannot even suffice to feed everybody. So we need to think differently. Now, what about the entire world? Land is not changing. Land is not increasing in size. 
But the population is increasing. It has been said that by the year 2050, the population of the world will be over 9 billion. Nigeria is said by then will be the third largest country in the world. Over 400 million people. Now, we have not even fed 200 million. What are we going to do when we have that much people? So you can imagine. So we will need more land, but can we get more land? The answer is no. We have to think home garden. With home garden, we provide a veritable answer to the challenge of feeding Nigerians growing population with healthy diet. And this we can do in a sustainable manner. Also, the easy cultivation of fruits and vegetables, which are major component of the WHO LD diet recommendation. We can achieve this via home garden. The important of this vitamin, mineral, dietary fiber, plant protein, antioxidant, and all sorts. Now, again, studies have equally shown us that high and rich nutritional diet in vegetables and fruit have significantly risk of this stroke, diabetics, and some types uh, of cancer. This has been proven scientifically. Now, the ease of access to essential nutrients, which are required for children development and adults' healthy living. Now, the question is, do we produce what we eat? In 2017, I was in was uh, idea. We started nurturing in our organization. Produce 20% of what you eat. And I think I came up with that when I learned that the Federal University of Agriculture Abelkuta, has about 10,000 hectares of land. So I did a simple mass. I looked at the number of students and staff in the university. And I was discussing among my team. I said, on this university, on a daily basis, what it's not clear, but that is actually real, is the fact that over, listen to this, uh, over 5 million is spent on food daily. The university community. Over 5 million daily. Now, imagine if 20% of that can be produced by the school. And it's very easy. I was saying, all the food shops in the school they are there because they depend on the school. So they make money from the school. Now, a simple policy that says, if you are selling food in this school, you must patronize the school shop. And to do that, you must either they print a ticket or something that shows that you have bought certain amount of what you are selling from the school shop. When we do that, one thing is this, we have guaranteed a stable uptake for whatever will be produced on that school farm. And when we do that, you will be shocked. The ripple effect of that decision. So now, if that happens to FAB, what about Unilag? What about UI? What about OAU? These are schools with several hundred or thousands of people staying on the campus daily. And I, with this practice, the school can generate a lot of ROI. I'm telling you, just saying 20% of what is consumed on this campus. When I was the manager of course, at Landmark University, the things we were producing at Landmark, we opened the shop at Covenant. So I met with the head of the ventures in Covenant and we were discussing. I said, give me the amount of certain things that we produce that you consume on a monthly basis. When I got the list, I was shocked. I said, you mean you consume this much? He said, yes. So it's, the, the opportunity is massive. Massive. Which we are not meeting. So what if every institution household, organizations can produce 20% of what you consume. And you now set a goal. Every year we increase that by 5 or 10%. That means in 10 years we can actually be food sufficient. Certain food. 
most especially vegetables and fruit. I don't see any organization or any household that cannot actually produce the amount of fruit and vegetables that they consume by themselves or their organization. So it's very easy and impossible. Now, when we said this, one thing I learned is don't just talk. Can we put it to practice? So we began to pitch this to talk to people around and then let's build business around it. I have a policy. Every problem have an entrepreneurial solution. So whatever program I design, I design a business solution to it. So it won't just be uh, you needing support that cannot be sustainable. So we found a way to make it sustainable. And my presentation will show you quite a lot about what we have done about you producing what you eat. So when I had the vice president talking about Operation Feed Yourself, I laughed. I said, yes, now we are getting there. If this can now come out from the government, that means it's very possible and it will happen. Now, what about sustainable health diet? There, it's a different thing to have good diet. It's another thing for that to be sustainable. Sustainable health diet refers to all dietary patterns that promote all dimensions of individual's health and well-being. Especially when you have low environmental pressure and impact. And then the health or the diet is accessible, it's affordable, it's safe, it's equitable, and then are culturally acceptable. This is the definition that the FAO and the WHO gave for sustainable um, health diet. Now what or why sustainable, or what the sustainable health diet uh, portends to achieve. It starts to achieve optimal growth and development of every individual, and then support the functioning, physical, mental, and social well-being of all, of all life stages for present and future generation. Again, it starts to contribute to preventing all forms of malnutrition. Uh, we call this eating hunger. A lot of people don't know about eating hunger. You know, in this climb, we, we prioritize calorie over nutrition. Uh, what our people care about, the stomach should be full. You know, somebody eats a bar in the morning, eats rice in the afternoon, drinks garin in the night, you know. Calories, just, just fill up the stomach. And these are led to a lot of challenges. So eating hunger is one big thing. And if sustainable health diet will do something, it must tackle the area of eating hunger. Another aim that it uh, pertains to achieve is to reduce the risk of diet-related non-communicable diseases. Several, several, several of such. But with that, it can be ad addressed also to support and prevent biodiversity and then plenary health. Sustainable health diet refers, okay, I've, I've mentioned that. Um, now, in essence, sustainable health diet seeks to combine all dimensions of sustainability in order to avoid unintended consequences, which we all know. It also stands to provide an holistic approach and transformation of global sustainable food system. Now, the need to promote diets that are healthy and have low environmental impact, the word environmental impact, as well as being socioculturally acceptable and economically acceptable to everyone. Hence, this transformation must be premised on original and authentic innovative thinking. Approaches and methodologies that adapted for each region, nation, and local realities on the basis of their own distinct and unique characteristics. That is, what we will design for the north should be technically different from what we should de design for the east, for the south, and all that. We have different environmental factor, we have different cultural factor, and different things. So we should not just say it's going to be one single approach to meet every. No, it must be different, but it must be localized, localization. So, 
the current food system is plagued with numerous challenges and we all know that resource scarcity environmental degradation uncontrolled and unsustainable production and consumption pattern biodiversity loss most especially post harvest loss and um, food wastage so why do we now need ld dye sometimes in holland we're looking for this milk um, this canned milk a friend of mine was sharing with me and he said he was told sorry we we don't take canned milk here canned milk is shipped to you people you know we take fresh milk talking about nutrition over calorie it's it's very important so all these strong bones, strong teeth, protection against malnutrition, health, diabetes management, health living, and all that are premised on how nutritious the food that we consume is. We are actually what we eat. And that's the truth. So it is what we eat that actually becomes what we do. You will see me use words later like pharmacy. When I say pharmacy, I'm not talking about P-H-A. I'm talking about F-A-R-M. We believe from your food, you can actually heal yourself, you know. So, and these are some of the very important reasons or the relevance of what is called the home gardening system. Now, why home gardening system in breaking it down? Lastly, I will say resource efficiency, responsible production and consumption of food. Talking about some of the SDGs, climate smart agriculture food security, healthy living, nutrition, and then well-being, reduce carbon footprint, wealth creation, and job creation. These two talks about zero poverty. That's the first SDG. So home garden can actually affect or answer several of the SDG goals. And you will see how we've been doing that. Now, we just said 30 minutes to the market from the home garden. This is one of our gardens. That lady there, you can see her on our farm. And from that farm, she took this to the market. That's a customer. This customer, prior to when that farm was started, depends on lettuce from about 500 kilometers away. So by the time the lettuce will get to his table, it's no longer in a good condition. And you know, food generally, the moment you pluck it from the tree, it starts to lose its nutrients. You understand? Now, traveling that far, then this farm came up. Since this farm has been established, it's only when they don't have um, what to sell. And it's an household farm, small farm, in the neighborhood. You understand? They kill for that meat and nutritious veggies. What about this? What about this? From the backyard. Some of this backyard. These plum, fine, beautiful tomatoes. You know? So it, it's not only fresh. It's not only good looking. It's nutritious. So when you take this like this as men we've been told that tomato is one of the most important food especially to guide against uh, what do we call it postrate men eat tomato but they hardly see the impact of that tomato why what type of tomato have they been eating what type of tomato have they been eating there was a particular variety of tomato i grew and um just some few quantities and the way people were rushing it, he said, I've been reading about that tomato. They told me it's the richest form of tomato. I want it. So it's, thank you, sir. So it's not just about producing this food. Proximity, quality. And to achieve good proximity to the market, home gardening, it's necessary. Now, one of the things we do, like I said, BIC farms, I remember when, when we started a particular type of farming called soilless farming, hydroponics. 
I visited a number of farms outside the country. And the thing that kept coming to mind is, where are we going to get the kind of money to establish these type of farms? Then an idea came to mind. In 2003, when I started fisheries, okay, I, when I graduated, I worked for a month. I didn't enjoy the job. I told my father. He said, what do you want to do? I didn't know a particular thing I wanted. Why Rigma rolling? He asked, will you take farming as a business? I said, let's try it. So in 2003, fisheries was not too prominent. It was just coming up. So he introduced me into fisheries. I said, I will not want to focus more on growing table fish. I will prefer the fingerling. That will give me money fast. And the reason I said that, when he was buying fish for his farm, he waited for five months before he could get his supply. There were very few big ashes then. So you kill, you wait a long time. So I said, there must be a good opportunity, you know. So I said, okay, let me learn how to grow fish. And somebody taught me how to breed. But we're just producing 500, 500 1,000. I said, I want 20,000. Then we met somebody who passed through my father at Olabisha Nobanjo University, Mr. Yeni. And he said I should come for an apprentice program in his place. When I got to that farm in Ibado, for the first time I saw over 200,000 juveniles. I screamed, is this possible? And the size of room he was using. You can produce this much in a small space? So I saw the secret, technology, recirculating aquaculture system. So for two months, I went through the system and I understood it. But I had a problem. I couldn't afford bar filter. Then we're buying bar filter from Holland. The minimum quantity I could buy was 500,000. Where would we get that from? Then an idea came. Why looking at the bio filter? You know, the key about bio filter is when you feed fish, they defecate in the water and all that. Ammonia is built up and what have you. Now, catfish most especially can breathe oxygen from the surface. But they don't grow by that oxygen. They grow with dissolved oxygen inside their water. So you must be able to give them clean water if you want to make good money. So using the biofilter, we culture nitrosomonas, nitrobacter bacteria. They break down ammonia to nitrate and all that. But it was, so why looking at the surface of the biofilter? I just, the picture of that stone, pumai stone, that women used to walk their leg. We all know this. That picture just came to mind. With all this surface area, I should be able to use it to culture bacteria. But how will I stack it? Then I saw an empty Coca-Cola crate. You know, it has 24 holes. So I, I bought Coca-Cola crate, took Pumai stone, stack it up, wrapped it, built some things around it, and then tested it. Wow. What I would have spent 500000 to achieve, I spent about 60000 Now, my dream then was to produce 20,000 fingerlings. You know, after I was graduated from my apprenticeship program with that man, I invited him to come to my farm five weeks after to see what his boy has done. And he hugged me and screamed. You know what I had? 80,000 fingerling with that localization. And that was how things opened up. So I was not only producing fish, I now even began to now teach people, you can use this and move. So when hydroponics started, that was just the thing that came back. We don't have to depend on foreign equipment. How can we localize it? And I remember what we were able to do during the fish time. And all this started coming up. So we began to use local materials to set up farms. You know? And you will be amazed at... That's why I said, these are farms here. Not American picture. Not South Africa. Not um, Europe or China. These are things done here. Um, I, I learned this method of thinking. Always think like a beginner. Which are we tell us here. 
if I ask every one of you, what is this? What will be the answer? Um, so what if this is empty? What will it be? Plastic. So that's how professional things. And most of us think that way. And that's why we don't achieve or get to solve our problems. Think like a beginner. Instead of saying plastic bottle, I will ask, what can I do with it? Now, let me ask you, what can you do with an empty bottle of this? So that becomes a flower vase. You have created something. What can you do with this? Ready? Funnel. You have created a funnel. Two things. Instead of just bottle now. Seedling. So, seedling container. What can you do with this? Just sit yourself down and start asking yourself that same thing you have given a name to. Now, change that thinking. What can I do with it? This was PVC pipe. I didn't call it PVC. I asked, what can I do with it? It became a farm. You know, there was no big magic, really. It, it was just system thinking. I'm a fellow of Ashoka, and uh, one of the things I learned from Ashoka is system change. It's the thinking that goes into things that determines what you do or achieve with that thing. So we start asking, what can I do with this? And a lot of things began to come up. Can you see? This particular farm, it's somewhere in Guarnipa here in Abuja. Yes. The next state, pit floor and all that. But we turn into a forest. LD nutritious kale. Bosu. Uh, lettuce. Beautiful things started growing from there. Because we asked, what can we do with this material? So I'm asking you, what can you do with so many things around your house? You know, today when people come to me and ask, uh, how much do I need to achieve this? I said, there is no certain answer to you. We as an organization have some things we have customized, we have built. But for you, I don't know what you have. You may actually have half of what you are looking for, which you may not need to buy. And that's the truth. So the moment we start asking, what can I do with it? You will be amazed at what we come up. Now, the imperatives of innovation in home gardening for sustainable healthy diets in Nigerian household. Why that? Look, post-COVID-19 era, we all know what has been said here. Why has COVID not have the kind of impact it had elsewhere? In fact, um, some of my family members were talking from Canada and they said, you know we'll start using vitamin D capsules. Now, what we never thought was important when we're in Nigeria, as simple as that, do you know the, 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 the part LD diet play in our immunity? Especially in this COVID or post-COVID era. So, eating, living, and staying healthy. Look at the problem of climate change and its effect. It's massive. You will get to see some of the things that the effect and then the solution to it. The state of insecurity in the country. Of people cannot go to their farms. Eh? So they are around where they reside. The clash between farmers and earthmen. It's lack of creativity. I tell you today, there are several things that can be done that we don't even need to graze our animals like we used to. There are no things we are saying. There are things we are practicing. I will show you some of them. Kidnapping issue. You know what led to that? The banditry and what have you. So urban farming and gardening can help to create sustainable food gardening, nutritious sensitive agriculture, food security availability, accessibility and all that. What about the CSA model and the home garden? 
this is one model I will actually introduce to some of our institutions and schools. Sirs, Amas, for those young children, students or pupil, do a CSA for them. CSA means community supported agriculture. We are doing it as a business now. L look at this. You live in an estate and there are about 200 homes in that estate. There is no home or household in that state that will not consume habanero pepper, tomato, um, different type of vegetables. You can actually evaluate what is required per week. Then meet all your neighbors. Tell them, this is January. I supply your year need of this particular vegetable. We can supply it. All you need to do Every week, evaluate how much do you spend? Let's pick habanero pepper. Habanero is rodo. Let's pick that. How much rodo do you consume in a week? Let's assume 1,000 naira. That means 4,000 naira per month. Am I right? Am I right? How much per year? 48,000. Pay me 48,000 now. And I will supply you rodo every week all year round. You know why? The prices will vary because of the peculiarity outside. What you were buying for 1,000 naira in January may actually be 2005, somewhere in, uh, sometimes in late May, June. Because some of these peppers don't do well on the way. Do you understand? But you have negotiated with those people. You have given them a standardized price all year round. So when somebody pay you that, that farmer you have paid that to does not need to go to the bank to look for loan. Imagine he has 10, 20 farmers supporting. That's a community support. And he used that to establish his farm within that same neighborhood. And all he produces is for those who have supported him. So if those who have supported him, he tells himself, 50% of my production goes to them. The remaining 50% to others. With the remaining 50%, he can make money anyhow. You understand? Based on the particular situation. But he has gotten creative loan to set up and run a farm. This we can do with our students. We graduate. The school, using this, our school shop system, to ensure every shop buys from the school farm. The school we guarantee, okay, take this 100,000. Every month, every week, you must supply our outlet. So, so, so quantity. So, it doesn't need to go to take loan. And then, a market is already guaranteed for him. You will be amazed at the number of students and people we will encourage to go into production. So CSA is a lovely model that I will encourage us to think about. Parents, you can do that for your children. My son is here with me. He's 11. Do you know the way he thinks now? Just last week, he wanted to buy a, food, a particular football. And he calculated in his mind, 4,000 naira. So I went to his mom. I take my car to car wash to wash. My wife does that too. We wash the cars at the car wash 700 naira for a car, my home 1000 naira. He charges for 500 and washes the car. So he makes 1000 per car. So he sat down. How many days do I need to wash the car for to make this out? Yes! You can use that to encourage your children. Okay, produce this particular pepper, produce this particular vegetable for us. We will buy it from you. Take up front. Go and produce. These are things we now need to think about when we are talking about creative ways, innovations. Because what you buy from the garden in your home, let me tell you, is far better than anything you buy from any market. Especially nutritious wise. So don't tell me there is no space. Look at this 
found even on the wall on the wall just look at this and like I said simply asking questions what can I do with this do, do you love this you like the picture you are saying you know somebody came to me and said what kind of materials are you guys using and smiled this is just roof gutter but I didn't see roof gutter when I looked at one I saw a trough you know and you won't believe so many things that has been done with that trough look, look at these young people now that's fodder that fodder in the second picture there took only seven days to grow that's the same fodder you tried to grow on the soil in 90 days that grows fodder that grows seedlings there's something called wheat grass wheat actually later is a very nutritious food the same wheat at this offshoot cut it blend it extract the water you'll be amazed it's in the superfood a lot of um, smoothie shops that we have now developed systems for in Lagos and that's all they produce smoothie so you can imagine now look at this young guy he's no longer afraid of the farm you can see him smiling when I was growing up farming used to be a punishment you offend your teacher they give you cutlass go and cross the grass now creatively we have now made farm attractive instead of punitive. And look at it's inside the compound. Can, can you see? So children are excited about things like this. I said LP mother and daughter bonding. Together. Mommy and daughter. Because this is an interesting type of farm. You know? Young people are excited. They come every time. Look at their farm in their compound. They are happy. They know I'm, I'm the one that will produce this one this week. I'm the one that will grow that. So these are some of the things that we don't. What about gender equality? If, I don't know if we still have those pictures in Abuja. If we do, some of us, our... Um, how do I put it? Our work is to go to these schools and tell them you must change the painting of your wall. You see, schools paint farmers as dirty people on their walls. Women wearing torn wrapper on their, across their shoulders. Men wearing all manner of things. Why you show other people a different type of picture? When I started and then we were building a lot of home gardens, I, I changed my dressing to the farm. Sometimes I go to farm in jacket. Because I looked around. What are the things encouraging Yahoo Yahoo and some of these things? It's because this boy sees a friend that does not even know anything. Now he comes in a big car and do you get what I'm trying to say? And he feels, ah, I can't achieve that. But now we change the narrative. Let them know you can actually look good even as a farmer. Some of uh, my team members at BIC, they, they started coining all sorts of names for themselves. The ladies will tell you, I'm a slave farmer. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you will be amazed. They've now made it interesting. Let me say something about our young people. It has been said that the average age of farmers in this climb is 60. Yet, Nigeria is the youngest country in the world. The average age of people around there is around 25. Thank you, sir. Young people are not only creative, they are passionate. Whatever they set their mind to do, you'll be shocked. Get them involved big time in farming. Food security problem in Nigeria will be solved. I tell you that. But how do you do that? It must not be with the same cutlass and all. That were created 2,000 years ago. And that's what we are still using. No, it shouldn't be. We need to redesign it. We need to make it look attractive. Let them come forth first. Then they start asking questions. What can I do with this particular material? 
Then we see the new generation of farms. Imagine. You know, at BIC Farms, I said our uh, innovation in home garden has given back to so many things. BLS, uh, BIC Soilless Gardening, BIC Urban Garden and Farming Vegetable, uh, Vertical Growing Systems, Aquaponics, Home Gardens, all sorts. This is a farm. You can see, and that's a farmer. And you can see how they are looking. It's a new generation of people, sorry, in farming. That's a farm. Just using some materials that we, we don't even think could do some interesting things. Curves. You can see the beautiful farm that have been created from there. This, this particular farm is opposite the medical council here in Abuja. Yeah. Just look at this. A small space growing this beefsteak vegetable. Look at this tomato. How many of us have seen black tomato before? Black tomato, Google it, is one of the richest type of tomato. It's richer than the red part. You can call it black, you can call it purple. But just look at it. Amazing. Growing in your compound. You can grow this. Your veranda is not even left out. Yes. This is in Lekki on the fourth floor. Veranda farm. This is in Ogba. That's a larger as this below. She grows a mushroom inside. Oh, you see, some of us think some things are very difficult. All you need to do, for example, this is just a mushroom floating room. The substrate comes from somewhere. And she just brings the ramified ones, stack them. An harvest package. She has some very, in fact, uh, what do you call it? Um, this type of mushroom. She has a, have, you, have you eaten smoked mushroom before? You will, thank you, sir. If you go to shop right, you see our mushrooms there now. Smoked, dried, different types. She gave me something one day. I screamed. Smoothie from mushrooms. She took the same oyster mushroom, boiled it with meat, sieved it. I've not, in fact, it's amazing. It's not only feeling very nutritious. And these are not difficult to create. Just in our backyard. You know? What about an aquaponics garden? The water from your ornamental fish grows vegetable. It's attractive to young people, attractive to old people. So you are doing several things with the same effort. Just look at this. Homegrown nutrition, that's what we call it. Customer skill for these vegetables. I'm telling you. The skill for them. The taste. The everything. I said look at the pharmacy. A small space. Inside somebody's compound. In fact this pharmacy. This pharmacy. Is somewhere around. Metama. They carved out a small space and said, put a garden there for me. And you won't believe it. Look at it. Don't tell me you don't have space. Space is no longer an issue.
or you can do quite a lot. Quite a lot. Building food gardens. Part of your company is to be your loan. Pay and all that. Turn into a pharmacy. Turn into a home garden. All this here in Nigeria. The, the, the particular farm on my right hand side, the one on top there, is inside Aso Drive. That one. So, I believe that we can foster innovation and do quite a lot of things more. One of the things that gave us a major breakthrough in home garden is when I came across a particular product. You know, it was expensive growing wild soil because that's one of the biggest issues, or that has been one of the biggest issues. And one of the biggest challenge we've had with hydroponics has been substrate. Even though Nigeria produces coconut, we import a lot of it. There is a material which, which was our most important material called our substrate. It's called cocoa peat. I used to import it from India and Sri Lanka and we spend a lot of money on that. So, like I said, I kept asking myself, how can we localize? I, I live actually in Abel Okuta, though I travel a lot. There is a particular place in Abel Okuta called Lafenwa. At that Lafenwa, you have a hub of millers. Some of us have heard about Ofada rice before. So Ofada is not just local rice. Because they sell some type of rice to some people, saying it's Ofada. Ofada is a community in Ogun State. That community produced a type of rice with a particular smell. And that's why, where our father came from. So, Lafenwa is where most of other rice is being milled. And they have this heap of rice husk. When we started thinking secularity, global warming and all that, and I went there, I said, what can we do to this rice husk? We started taking it Let's compost it. Let's do some things. We were having issues. Then I met someone who showed me a product that answers several questions. That product, is, that thing is actually called uh, a rice steak. It's a soil conditioner originally. Uh, an inoculant you put in water. What I built, several thousands what about filter for? Small amount does it without any stress. I added it to my substrate and tweaked it. Then we started. We discovered that you can do soil farming without fertilizer, without hydroponic nutrient. That was the most expensive part of hydroponics. When we started mixing that in, it, it was too good to be true. In fact, the, the organization that brought that thing to Nigeria, they kept asking me, so what do you have to say? I didn't want to tell them I found something. I just kept packing them aside. I said, don't worry, we will talk. So everybody must not know this is one of my secrets. <laughs> but I remember one of the UN goals, 17, talks about collaboration works. And I told him, this thing you have in your hand, <laughs> you don't know that it's magic. Yesterday, somebody owns a farm here in Abuja, massive farms, one of the biggest tilapia farms around. And we're talking, calculating how much he spends on electricity to add oxygen to his water. And I just showed him that with that same little thing, it will save 95% of that cost. He couldn't believe it. So, a lot is here in Nigeria that have answered our questions. We only need to know about them. We only need to apply them. We only need to use them and see what it can do. We also started an initiative called Hydroponic Farm Lab 
for our schools. And then we've been able to set up a number of schools. I was sharing some few videos with uh, the moderator yesterday. I don't know if he wants to show us. Testimonies of young students in schools. There are farms that they have built and all that. So these are some of uh, the things and the big uh, innovations that can come. And I believe fostering innovation in home gardening for sustainable healthy diet in Nigerian household is not uh, only achievable, it can be achievable sustainably across board. So thank you very much. Uh, I will stop here. Please, we can do better. Can we give him a round of applause? The lecture was boring, right? Let's do it again. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Debo, for the nice presentation. Uh, that was really great. Quite insightful, full of information, and um, um, I'm sure that quite a lot of people have questions here. But we will not answer the question yet. I'm going to also, we would like to also take another short experience. Uh, I mean, we just don't want to leave this place and then nothing happens, right? But it's been working. It shares some experiences. And we will listen to another experience. I'd like to call Dr. Shay Isiejo to come share uh, exploratory gardening experience on kids in vacation school. Shall we put our hands together for her, please? Good morning, um, ladies and gents. I would like to stand on the existing protocol. Um, and I want to thank the last speaker. It was, it was a very inspiring um, presentation that you made. And I want to say that a lot of the things you said are true. I live in a place I don't have land, but I have a bush, a big bush. I grow things in buckets, in sacks. I have ginger, I have garlic. I have all my spices and stuff. I don't have land. I just have a cemented compound. And then I turn the flower bed to vegetables outside. But people were coming to steal the tomatoes, so I got discouraged doing it outside my fence and all that. But it's true. And it started as a child. We had gardens since I was growing up. So maybe that's what inspired kids new time. Um, please, can you go to the next slide? So, okay, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. I just want to get um, a hang of it. It doesn't go back. I want to go back. Okay, so uh, I'll present based on this outline. Um, give us a brief history of what Kids Nutrition Garden is about and um, what we do, lessons we've learned, and I'll share some pictures. By the way, my name is Shelly Isi. I'm from the University of Ibadan there. Um, but I also run this every August of every year. And it started with um, thinking about, I, I, my PhD is in vegetable um, consumption, traditional local vegetables, the we do the amaranthus and all that. I found out that it contributes a lot to micronutrient intake, but we are not eating enough of it. 
and then we eat, eat it in only one way. If it's not soup, then you can't help people to be eating it every day, and so on. And then children, we're not eating it. So how do we get children to eat more vegetables? So it was a pilot project with me and my student. The student who started it is here. The person who gave the UNICEF presentation in Kiru is here. So that was her BSc project. We started it by incorporating it into summer school garden. Um, we wanted to go to a school, but we couldn't um, get schools. So we used the, my church organizes summer school for young children. I discussed with the, my parish priest. He said, oh, no problem. So we, it was part of their timetable. Twice a week, they will come to UI. We funded the bus, bring them to UI. UI gave us, um, our teaching and research and gave us a children-friendly um, space. We started to grow vegetables. In four weeks, we grew vegetables. We taught them how to make their noodles that they like with vegetables because we, we also reached that. What are those foods children eat mostly? Noodles was one of it, eggs, and so on. So, through the vegetables, they invested them, we taught them how to go, and then linked it to nutrition. This is what it does to your body. Oh, how you, you go to the toilet and you poop and you're shouting, oh, mommy, you can't come out. When you eat vegetables, it will come out. And things like that. We started to link it. So, this is what we do. We started in 2016, it was a project. We did it in 2017. By 2018, Alex said, can't you turn it to a full something? But I said, what will we be doing Monday to Friday? So you talked about systems thinking. And we summoned courage and we started in 20, 2019. It was the first time we did it in um, full flesh, the whole of August up to first week of September. So we do it, it's outdoor and indoor. And at least to date, we have reached over about 100 children, the families and the community because we also engage the community. Okay, so what's our goal? It's to catch them young, inspire and influence healthy eating among children, to prevent their predisposition to, to malnutrition, especially micronutrients and the non-communicable diseases, because these things start from when we are young. They accumulate in our body. And then we also want to provide evidence-based for integrating this into school, primary school, not just at secondary school. But let's start when they are very young. So our vision is to nurture generations of healthy eaters, one child at a time. And then our philosophy, we believe that the habits and skills that children get when they are young, they take it to adulthood. I garden today because from when I was small, I always saw a garden and vegetables growing and we give neighbors and friends if there was no money in the house, we would take the vegetable to the market. At, when I was eight years old, my cousin would sell, we'll bring money back to the house, and we we'll eat. So, and things like that. Uh, so, and this uh, program falls within the purview of the innovative um, actions for the food systems to improve nutrition, education, and behavioral changes for children um, to learn and adopt healthy practices. And we know things that children learn. They take it home, and they say, they taught us this. Mommy, we must do this. I have families now that it was only one of the children that came for the program in one year, but all the children in the house, because we have an age group that we deal with. All the children eat vegetables, have a garden now, and when mom is going to the market, mom, you hope you're going to buy vegetables. Have you added it to, the, to this food and so on? So that's how we influence farming directly, because we know even from the children, we can start home gardens as well, once they know what to do. This is um, how we run it. There is a coordinator, I coordinate, but we put a program manager, someone who runs day to day, and then we've been able to derive all of this. So it's like a full something. The whole of August, our department is buzzing. My colleagues can testify to that, the noise and all, but it's very interesting. Um, what do we do? Now, it's called Nutri Garden Vacation School. So the, the basis of it is that it's a garden enhanced nutrition education. It's not just going to the farm to learn, but we link it to nutrition because we are nutritionists anyway. And why do we grow food to eat? And why do we eat? We want to eat healthy and stay alive. 
So these are the things we do, interactive nutrition education tied to hands-on gardening. So for whatever we grow, for whatever we do, there is a nutrition link. So we teach them in class. We do food demonstration and in classes. So we start from everything, the nutrients in the food. We bring fruits and vegetables. They identify, they taste, they smell, and so on. Then we cook the vegetables that they have grown. And that's, that's, that's very exciting for the children. Children. They like to, many of them don't cook in the house. Their mothers will not let them enter the kitchen. But we let them enter the kitchen. We guide them. They use the knives. They cut the vegetables. They cook. And they get on. They say, Mommy, I can do it. Let me pluck the vegetables. Let me cut it. So on. Then, also added physical activity in time because um, physical activity and um, the healthy tree eating are complementary. So they know that gardening. Is they do some spots to make them enjoy themselves. We do escort to places that give them um, more information about what they do. Then we engage the family through newsletters. We produce newsletters at the end of every week. We summarize what they've taught, garden, um, nutrition, education. There's a recipe for the week which they should try, come back to give us experience. There are puzzles. They should guide the families. So that's how we engage them. Then interdisciplinary partnerships. We don't do it alone. I'm not a farmer. For, I'm a farmer, but not the type that can do that kind of thing. So we have people who are experts that join us to train. So we do this. People do donate seeds. Um, in 2019, NIHOT, Institute of Horticultural Research, donated seeds that were planted. This year, FRIN, Federal Research Institute of Nigeria, gave us compost, organic compost that they grow. So we collaborate like that um, with different groups that can support what we do um, in, in, in nutrition. So, um, and then at the end of it, we have um, a community event. We invite the general public, the children exhibit what they've done. They sell those things. We have the vegetables we sell. They make the recipes they sell. And we, we generate some funds and um, gain other skills. So these are gardening activities. So it is from land preparation to harvest for the four weeks that they're with us. So they do all of this. Um, for nutrition education, we teach them about eating a rainbow. I mean, fruits and vegetables are different colors, so you eat a rainbow. We teach them about food groups and the store food. So you are eating noodles. Where did noodles come from? We trace it back to the plant. So that's why the plants are important, down to the soil. So when they are eating something, they say, oh, okay, where did this one come from? And they're able to track that food back, whatever food that they are eating, and so on. Identifying vegetables, identifying healthy versus junk food, food hygiene, and so on. Then in the cooking classes, we have developed recipes that incorporate vegetables and fruits into their favorite meals. We have done analysis in the lab, nutrient analysis, so they are, they are nutritious and so on. So um, what are the lessons we have learned? We know that children are impressionable and they are able to extend their learnings home. Um, we need... Um, but we also learned that we need professional training in proper delivery of garden enhanced nutrition and education. It's not just to have a garden in the school or to do agri or to do nutrition. It doesn't work that way. There has to be something that links it, and I think that has been the issue. Um, gardening has to be tied to something. It has to have um, a focus. It has to have a goal. So what's the purpose of having a school garden, for example? Once we know the goal, we can tie it to the curriculum. Then we also know that we've learned up the potential to improve children's dietary practices, which can then be extended to the household, is best achieved by multi-component strategies at different social organizational levels. What do I mean by that? It's not to do just nutrition education. Go home and tell them that. Go to school. Carbohydrates is important. Fruits and vegetables is important. Other things are important. How we grow the food, the environment, the soil, the water, everything is important. And Everything around is also important. Family is important. The community is important in helping us to drive this initiative. Then collaborations. I have talked to some of the organizations who support us. 
every year. And, um, it's very important, and that's what makes it happen every year, both from private and public um, partnerships. And then um, the use of newsletters to reach parents. Then we've also discovered resources needed. Funding is critical. In 2019, we did an online fundraising. It was, it was so important to us that we went online. One organization that um, does online fundraising uh, supported us. We raised funds online to run it. When we do that, the cost of, on the children is less. Um, so that we did, and a lot of people supported us, friends, family, and organizations. And then we know that we need garden space, imputes, Seeds, tools, and, and um, good soil, soil food, all that. This year we had an experience. We got seeds from, well, it was a recommended place, but when we planted the seeds, it didn't come out the way we wanted. So that was a big lesson for us, that where we get our seeds is very important. And then the manpower, food demonstration facilities. We need well-designed and aligned curriculum content. We have done that. We have put together we curriculum to teach. It's an abridged one because it's for four weeks. So we are looking forward to get a grant to run the curriculum in a school for like a school term so that we see how it works. We've already done expert validation. So it's to now take it out and test it with the real participants. So we're hoping we'll get a grant soon to achieve that. Then. The activities must be fully participatory. When the children participate, do everything themselves. It works out. I'll show you some, some of the experiences with the children wrote themselves. Because every day we make them write, what did you learn today? What was your learning experiences? And they write it down in their own words. Emphasis on hand sunking and gardening. And linking the concepts with nutrition is important. Then using the produce directly from the garden to make meals. What I grew by myself, I will cook it by myself, and I will eat it. That vegetable that they will not eat at home, because they prepared it, they harvested it, and they cooked it, they will eat it. It's, it's always, and then, you know, all other children are doing it. So that's what happened. What are the challenges we have, um, we have seen in setting up school gardens? We went out to do a research, because we have done feasibility. We're trying to do feasibility of how to implement this in a normal school setting. And these are some of the challenges. Professional development and training in delivering garden enhanced nutrition education in schools. Lack of resources, lack of purposeful nutrition and a Greek aligned curriculum. The space for gardening, administrative commitment, time. The teachers are, are worried about where would they fit it into an already choked curriculum. Political will, stakeholder commitment, funding, Lack of interest. They say it's dirty. You know, the impression our last speaker gave that they think it's a dirty job, but no, we have to give it a new um, face. So, um, well, pictures speak a thousand words. So these are some of our children. This is what a child said this year. This one, this one, uh, a participant for this year said, I learned that people work hard for the food we eat every day. So we should not take food for granted. I learned that we should appreciate people who work hard and make food for us to eat. What I love most in the garden. What I love most in the garden was watering the plants and also removing the weeds from the plants. Because we tell them that the weeds, if they affect your plants, it will not come out well. So, so that your plants will not be malnourished. And no, they don't like that. They want to take care of the plants. So these are what happens. So awareness comes with appreciation. Once they are aware, they, they appreciate what is going on with their food, knowing where their food comes from. One of them is the first time of interacting with soil and plants, and they enjoy it. They play with the soil and so on. Learning by doing. These are some garden activities. They are weeding, they are watering, they plant, and so on. Um, this is what we do in the kitchen. So we've harvested vegetables, we are cooking, and doing everything by ourselves. And when we finish, we eat, we eat what we have done. And we give them names. That noodles is called Kids Nutri Garden Olalashos Veggie Noodles. That's the name of our Nutri Garden Noodles. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's the children that give it names. So when they've eaten it, they 
they will call a name for it. So we note it down. Those are our recipes. That's our signature recipe. This is another child. He said, I learned how to make veggie egg cup. And it is so delicious. In fact, it is egglicious. I made my own with vegetable oil and egg and different types of vegetables. So that's the picture. So that's our signature Kids Nutri Garden egglicious, ecstatic veggie egg cups. The name was given by the children. No? That's what they called it after making it and eating it. Egglicious and ecstatic. So this, this is the classroom doing nutrition education. It's interactive. It's playful. Um, and, and then they are enjoying themselves. And where we link it to gardening, to cooking, to physical like, um, activity and the environment. <clears throat> so um, this is physical activity. They go out to play and they come back and they talk about how it's important to healthy living. Mm -hmm. So engaging physical activity through healthy play and sports, it complements dietary practices, healthy dietary practices. Um, environmental and food systems literacy. They look at the soil. We, the, those who come to teach them the soil, the Federal Research Institute, the scientists from there come, teach them about soil. We visited their compost site. They donated compost to us to grow our vegetables. So this is where we learn about the environment and its importance, the food systems. And all through our excursions, they went on excursion to the place. So, um, oh, the joy of a bountiful harvest! I don't. If you have a garden or a farm and you are harvesting, how do you feel? So you, you can imagine the joy of the children. It is. You should. I wish we could show some videos. We have a video of that child was singing and <laughs> dancing, and then we do that. So the different vegetables we grow, we share with our colleagues and so on. So these are the, we did cucumber this year. Uh, we had some cucumber this year. So uh, these are community engagement. So on the last day, we have a food fair, exhibition, all the things we've learned, the recipes we've made, the children make them, they sell them, and they do that. We invite the members of the public. Um, and they come, they do it, the exhibition. This is where they are selling the vegetables, the snacks, they made with veggie, their veggie snacks, and so on, and telling the public about it. They do a lot of um, drama, song, that is related to what they have learned. This is, so this is all of us. Since 2016, different groups of children. This is 2021. So we've been building them. These are our volunteers. They are very strong. Um, they are a very strong part of our support system. They help us a lot um, in what we do. Um, so this is it from Nutri Garden to Fork. This year, I think we're growing mines in Nature's Garden, and we've been doing that since 2016. And um, that's what it is. They grow, grow it. They, they, they learn about it and then they eat it. Thank you very much. Okay, so I was going to say we should give a uh, luscious, eglicious, and ecstatic clapping. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Isiejo, for that great presentation. Uh, before I call on Avesp, uh, um, I'd like to also recognize Dr. Moa, a fellow at the, uh, the National Society of Nigeria. Please, you're welcome, sir. Uh, the first speaker, Mr. Adebowale, has written a book called Agropreneurs, the Emerging Millionaires, and uh, this book is sold for 2,500 naira. But he's given us for 1,000 error. So please, if you are interested, you can get a copy at the end of this meeting right here. Uh, so shortly, I'd like to call on Avest Plus. Uh, shortly, they would like to share their own experience as well uh, on home gardening projects they've embarked on just for seven minutes. Okay. 
seven minutes is quite short anyway. Well, but we'll try our best to at least pass a message. Okay, Harvest Plus works on biofortified crops, and we all know that most of the time when we say uh, food garden, food garden, we're actually referring to fruits and vegetables, more of vegetables than even fruits. So, um, but with the promotion of orange flesh sweet potato, it can easily fit into the school garden um, system, the backyard system. And so we have been promoting many, um, about three biofortified crops in Nigeria, Orange flesh, sweet, sweet, orange flesh sweet potato, vitamin A cassava, and vitamin A maize. But for this presentation, we are actually going to look at how we can incorporate OFSB into the school garden and the backyard garden, and then what and what recipes we can uh, make from them for household use. There isn't much time to say much, but um, I believe that we can pass that message to an extent. I have here one of our partners. We work through partners a lot, and um, it's always better to feel the experience, you know, from those that are actually doing it. So we have Mrs. Um, Mary Ihonu here. She wants to share briefly um, her experience growing about um, sweet potato at the backyard. And Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Permit me to stand on existing protocol. Actually, uh, <clears throat> I came, I was informed last night to bring some recipes from OFSP to just play, and then uh, now she just called us to come and share experience on the backyard farming and the farming OFSP as a crop. I just want to use this opportunity to tell us that the first speaker and the last speaker, they said it all. We are really privileged. With what the first speaker sp said, we can really make agriculture very, very interesting uh, from an uh, OSP point of view. Do you know that there's nothing from OSP that is a waste? The vine is money, the uh, vegetables can be consumed, and the root, of course. Maybe when we go out, we see the, some of the recipes that we prepared so that we know what this crop is capable of doing. And most importantly, what I want us to take home is that we don't need much land. You can use a cement bag. You have, the first speaker showed us so many ways that we can go. But bags, sacks, for those that we say that they, all their compound is uh, concrete, please, you can use that. Uh, and what? So please, we have no reason not to eat uh, nutrient dense crop. And this OFSP misses very well. In fact, among the varieties, we have one, Omo uh, SP003. It's called now uh, Mother's Delight. Why? Because of the color. And children love it so much. How many of us have seen OFSP crop? Can we show by raising our hand? Orange flesh sweet potato uh, root. How many of us have seen it? Wow. Good. So please, when we go out uh, to the exhibition ground, we see it uh, practically. And please, what I want to emphasize, because of that, before they will start warning me, is please, it is good that we uh, take at least one or two vines or three to multiply in our farms. And if you grow it in this uh, side, you are going to get good root that will be even like a yam. You'll be asking, ah. So this crop can grow really in, in this place. So people that have tried it are testifying to that. And there are so many ways it could be utilized, especially for this uh, food, um, school feeding program. It's very, very, in fact, uh, my colleague in Oshun made her money, Mrs. Okonlawo, when they, because uh, in all these days, I think Oshun is the one that is very, very, very effective in this school feeding program. And... When we, uh, she started with us in 2012, when the first variety was released, and the school uh, and the state adopted it, she was able to buy her own tractor with the proceeds from the OFSB as she was supplying. Now she is really making and my, my very self in my own farm. Ah, uh, device alone that I will sell just a bundle which is made up of 100 cotton materials. We sell for 500 naira. And you can. Uh, in a, a small space, like from here to the end of that, you can get up to 1,000 bundles. For those of you that farm OFS, you know what I'm talking about. And you know, when you get that 1,000, you know it is money. 
very good money. And also, uh, you cut uh, from six weeks uh, of that planting. It will be due for cutting to transplant. And it takes just three months for the mother to live variety. Um, SPP03. Or uh, the uh, solo gold that takes four months too. And uh, to mature. But what I'm emphasizing now is the vegetable from it is very, very nutritious. So from six weeks, you can start making very effective use of it. And when you allow it to grow and mature, you can process it. Into so many, I have developed in my book 32 recipes, various ways you can diversify the You Just as the first speaker said, when you just boil it and be given to the they will complain. But if you change it to nodules, because a company in Kuja here in Abuja, is using OFSP purely for nodules because we discovered that our children love nodules very much. But the unfortunate thing is that when they finish, they will export. I went to the, I confronted them in the company. I said, How can I be supplied? Because I am the orange flesh sweet potato desk officer at the OLF City. I will aggregate the, uh, the produce from the uh, farmers, we we'll send it to them. And after, when you turn them to nodules, instead of selling to our people to get the nutri uh, nutrient they need from it. You are exporting. They said, Madam, that what they are making outside, that Nigerians cannot pay for it. You can imagine that. You can imagine. In our own country, we, uh, in uh, Kujie here, uh, Kujie here in F City, the uh, company is there making it. In my, uh, one of my, my customers also brought bread made from this OFSP. And in fact, that's, he supplies at uh, Aso Villa. That's what they eat there. When we go to the stand there, you see the bread. You see all the recipes that we made from it. So, what am I saying in effect? The nutri this nutrition week, please, let's make effective use of it. Especially those of us from schools. If we can have school gardens, introduce it. It does not even require much nutrients uh, to grow it. Just like a white flesh uh, sweet potato. It does not require much fertilizer. It does work in marginal soils. We are cereals and other crops cannot grow if you put potato, uh, orange flesh with potato there. So those of you that have grown it, you, you believe what I'm saying. You must get something out of it. So please, it's a crop that promotes very because it's very, very rich in vitamin A, which is a precursor of uh, uh, beta, uh, uh, rich in beta carotenoid, which is a precursor of uh, vitamin A, which is very good for our eyes. Please, but what uh, is not when Somebody complains that he's having eye problems. We say, okay, go and eat orange flesh, people. Please go to the hospital. But what we are saying that if we are eating it, it will enhance your vision. And it's better to catch them young, as the former speaker uh, said, so that they will get used to it and they'll be eat, consuming it. So please, I want to believe that as many as we are here, you promise me that at least in your backyard, even if it's two of the sack, you'll be able to plant vines. But uh, we get free vines for you before the end of this program so that you go and try. At the end, you tell the Harvest Plus or Federal Minister of Agri your experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You said in their backyard, if you are not careful, they will start growing it here. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. I want to believe we have questions that we like to ask after listening to three different uh, people, and especially the guest speaker, Mr. Adebowali Onofowora. If you have questions, please, I would like you to raise your hand, and we can pass the mic across to you to ask your question, and also let us know who you are directing the questions to. Okay, I can see one hand there, another hand. Okay. Hello, good morning everyone. Um, I'm Juma Hassan. I'm a clinical dietitian, nutritionist. My question goes to Dr. Dr. Kinsley. Oh, all right, all right. Um, uh, we all know that uh, vegetables and uh, fruits are all good and um, well, so thank you very much for all the presentations. Um, uh, you know, the children are all, they are picky eaters, and um, um, I really want to appreciate what you have just said about uh, they integrating a vegetable into their eggs and uh, into their noodles as well. Well, um, I do 
I just want to ask if really use uh, the greens into the egg, green vegetable. Do you, do you combine it into the into their food, or how do you do it? Thank you. Okay. Um. Thank you for your question. For your question, she is asking if we if I want to get your question clear. Do we put the green vegetables in their egg? Yes. Um, we know amaranthus, the one we call green. Maybe Nigerians now call it spinach, but it's not spinach. Oh. It is amaranthus. The Yoruba people call it tete, efo tete, or shoko celosia. Those are the scientific names. I don't know what they call it in the north. Eh, eh. All those, that's what we grow. We grow amaranthus, celosia. We grow a we do, we grow. So those three, and um, ugu, telferia. Yes, we add it to their vegetables, to their eggs. We add it to um, cake. We even make cake with it. We add it to noodles. We, they do it themselves. We just slice it into it, and um, we make it into some sauce, and we add it, and they eat it. It's, it's as simple as, as that. Um, there is no... So the thing is, they work together to do it, and then after telling them that they Okay, you know what I'm going to do? So if you have a question, raise your hand, and I'm giving you a number, then I call the number. All right? Uh, you raise your hand long. One, sir. Two, three, four, five, six. Who else? Seven, eight, nine. So nine questions. So number one. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chris Akonwe. My question is uh, for the first speaker. The first question is, I want you to explain what you mean by the soilless garden. And that's one too. I want to know if you use the same type of fertilizer for all vegetables. And if yes or no, what are the different types of the fertilizers or the particular one you use for the cultivation of the vegetables. Thank you. Okay, number two, you can still ask. Number two, number two, you can ask questions. So we can take the word up. We are going to take the word up. I want to sincerely thank all our speakers for the wonderful presentation. My question goes to the first speaker. As a matter of fact, when that, uh, I watched that video clip very carefully. My concern is about fertilizer usage in the garden. Considering the fact that they are partially cooked. When that presentation was done for that coriander, I discovered that there was addition of fertilizer on the 30th day and 45, on the 5th, 45th day harvesting commenced. So looking at the time lag, I don't know how safe because if you look at it strictly, whether the fertilizers are from, are generated uh, from uh, organic materials, you cannot, you know, doubt the fact that some chemicals are still carried along with it. So they're not completely organic, so to say. So if you look at the time lag, the time you apply these fertilizers, and then the time of harvesting, because we are not looking at just get eating vegetables now, we are looking at the, you know, the, the health implication also. How safe are some of these, like uh, one of our speakers just said, you know, when you introduce these kind of vegetables into eggs, you know, how safe are some of these uh, uh, vegetables, bearing in mind the fact that fertilizers are added. I don't have any problem with the one added at the point of land preparation, but that one being added at 30 days. Thank you. Thank you very much for these wonderful presentations. My question goes to 
um, <laughs> the doctor, the second speaker. My question is this. This school uh, gardening is a wonderful experience. But I just, I just want to ask, how can we extend it to secondary school? Because you are using a primary school maybe as a pilot. How can we extend it to secondary school? If you look at the issue of diet in this adolescent nutrition, it's very, very poor. Most of adolescents, they eat a lot of junks. I have children as an adolescent. Even though as a mother, after preparing food, you put a lot of veg and provide vegetables, they will not like to take it. They will be frowning at it. But I believe maybe the Ministry of Education can just take recognizance of this. Maybe build it into their system in, in curriculum so that they will teach them and have more nutri um, nutrition education on this for them to eat right because it's what they eat now is what is translating to adulthood. And that is why we have a lot of uh, uh, non communicable diseases and they start from there. If you can extend it in secondary schools, make it compulsory so that they will learn it. I know that the incidence of these non-communicable uh, diseases will be reduced in the adult age. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the speakers. I've really learned a lot today, but um, I have a question that I would love to get answer to. And it's, I have experience, personal experience in home gardening, because I've there was a time in 2018 or 2019 that the ugu I ate for a period of almost six months is one from the one I planted. But there's this problem that people face that I, I was faced with that really discouraged me and stopped me from continuing. You start seeing um, patches on your vegetables, especially when it has grown very big and you are happy with what you're seeing. Suddenly something comes on it and you start seeing white, um, something eating like insects. Please, I really want the speakers from experience to tell us what to do at that point. What is it that we can introduce to those vegetables to stop the eating up of the vegetable and at the same time is not going to affect us health-wise. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, the speakers, and um, you have actually laoju me, meaning you don't open my eye. Some things when I don't know, I don't know now. For the fact that for me to even plant at the wall of my house, at the foot of my garden, um, my veranda, it has actually opened my eyes to understand that I must not look for a bigger land before I start planting my vegetables. Just like the big farming that we go out to farm where we have bandits and, uh, and all ca cattle remain eating all our crops and they're putting us into trouble. Even in the home garden, I think we also have people who steal our small, small vegetable, even without telling us. But my interesting is that I love what I just had and I'm very, very happy about it. And uh, my question is, what measures have you taken to sell these ideas to the federal government, the local government, and the state government, if possible, even the wards, so that it will be a, a kind of thing that not only little children in some schools are doing, but even those, our mothers, our fathers that are in the rural areas, in the state, and some of us who are working in the federal government, to also imbibe in it, so as to make it a popular situation. Because I remember one time in Nigeria, there was an a government that came and said, Operation Feed the Nation. Now we are looking at this one as what? Operation Home Garden, individual farming. So please, I want to know why, whether there's any way that this idea has been sold to the government. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, continue from there. I actually want to speak on uh, the use of inorganic chemicals in our farm um, home garden. And somebody has 
talked on that. Uh, what I've just said in that place is um, I think that we should be moving towards organic um, manure rather than um, inorganic um, uh, chemicals in our vegetables. Because as people have raised it, there are some effects we derive from them. And to the doctor, um, somebody has also speak on what I want to say. Uh, with your wonderful innovations, watching them young, I want to know what are your thinking of scaling up this. Somebody just mentioned it, uh, whether to link it up into school curriculum, uh, liaising with the uh, Ministry of Education, because what you are just doing is just a very minute in the larger population. And it, the benefit of that is very enormous to those minute class you are doing it to. How about the larger society? So I think that needs to be, we need to start looking at how we can sell these good ideas. Thank you. Who asked? Number seven? Okay. And then number eight? Okay. Then we can just do that at the same time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Debo and Dr. Isse. The, this was really a very innovative way for me for gardening, I mean farming, and also for the school. I know we do have school gardening and home gardening, but this concept was really quite new and I really learned quite a lot. I was just thinking, like you have taught me, Mr. Debo, how can I apply this to what I've learned? So I was thinking, most of us spend a lot of time in our workplace. Is there a way we can apply this, your concept, in our workplaces? So that not only are we, uh, do we have this at home, we also have this in the workplace where we can generate some um, a recipe, maybe use it in the, at home, or collect it from the workplace farm and go home and use it. And um, I, that's what I kept thinking. And um, secondly, is there a way we can have, somebody talked a, lot, a little about it, this speaker, the last speaker, is it possible for her, us to have organic farming, especially at home? When we have home Gandhi, instead of applying fertilizer, there are other things we can apply to make our food to grow well without applying the fertilizer. And then Dr. S.E.C., uh, I just wanted to know what is the age group for your children that comes into your kids' club? Because most of the time when we talk about kids' club, we always say 6 to 12 or 8 to 12 or something like that. I will, I'm very interested in the, in the age group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me uh, congratulate the society for organizing this uh, meeting. I also want to appreciate the speakers. Um, the concept that is being now enunciated is very timely. It's in, cons it's in consonance with the thinking of government that we should grow what we eat. Uh, if we fail to do that, the COVID experience has taught us where there's lockdown everywhere. And so those who could not move around, uh, we knew what happened to us. And we also saw the trigger with the answers, that the answers was on, not targeting any place, but start targeting the storehouses where palliatives were stored. A bit that as it may, uh, the three speakers presented the issue of home, is it uh, home gardening or school gardening as a very, very simple concept. For people in my category, it's very easy for us to sit back at home and, guard, and uh, do some gardening. But the challenge which we face and I'm sure my president will also testify to that, that government regulatory framework to ensure that we have good planting materials is not there. We'll go 
and buy planting materials in the name of good planting materials. And at the end of the day, you don't get the right uh, output as has been painted. Uh, in the back of my house, I won't call it back, uh, backyard garden, we planted some tomatoes, which we bought. But unfortunately, the tomatoes we were getting from that farm, even though it was producing tomatoes, but it was nothing that looked like tomatoes that I used to know. You understand? Sometimes they come like fingers. You understand? Tomatoes are not supposed to come like uh, uh, carrots. But by the time you are plucking tomatoes that look like carrots, you begin to wonder that is it worth your time? Is it worth the... Particularly in places like Abuja here, where we know we have limited time for rain. Because they are rain-fed. And then if they are not rain-fed, it means that you have to either employ a gardener or somebody to be wetting the farm for you. So at the end of the day, and the, the product you get is not there. I am also aware of government uh, uh, trying to ensure that we have seed companies. But in the name of promoting seed companies for inputs, we also have some mushrooms. So government still needs to do a lot more. Our ministries of agriculture, our departments of agriculture and the local government still need to also enhance uh, the extension services that those who want to do this can do it without stress. Otherwise, you all still have to depend on the farms, I said farms, on the markets to be able to get the Guarimpa experience, the Maitama experience. They are good experiences, but we need to know the trouble they went to before they got to that. And I'm sure these are some of the things that our presenters can also add. It's easy to say that go to US, you get everything easy. But they won't tell you the story of how you get to U.S. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Then, did I give you a number? Okay. I want to say thanks to the Nutrition Society of Nigeria for this particular project. It's, I'm glad. And that is why the FCT chapter we started, somebody was talking of the school. We tried to pilot a program last month because of the schools to establish food and nutrition clubs. We wanted six design schools, but because of the time and the sponsors we couldn't get, we limited it to them. And we hope that the FCC might pilot that to other schools, nutrition club. And you can see that even some of their teachers are here, especially the venue where we use. However, I want to tell thanks to the speakers, it's encouraging. And but it was an education sector representatives I saw, then I said, oh, people would have helped us, those schools, maybe because of money, those schools would have come with some representatives from those school children, at least five, five from those schools. It will still ginger them to encourage their teachers. In case next time, my president, Nutrition Society, sir. We can beef up the budget so as to bring in the students from those secondary schools, few of them. The teacher owned up when I was discussing that. If they have brought some of their students, it would make more impact to them in case next time. And in fact, our coordinator, the finance and budget minister in the secretariat, Madam, thanks so much for really collaborating with the society to do this, encouraging. Furthermore, I want to say that people were asking how can there was an issue of uh, these children, how can we integrate this? Since the nation has done now the issue of full system transformation, I know that they need to come to the federal to collaborate with federal minister through the budget, Ministry of Education, so that it can put into place. And we know how we can engage our first speaker so that he can help us know how to really fit into the nation and do this training in several places and they can engage you. It's good you link with the Minister of Education and make still the Budget and Planning Ministry because they will link you over so that they can help us bring out this particular lecture more and we can do it practical. Thank you so much. That's my suggestion.
much. Okay, my I have two questions. The first one is on a um, you know the first speaker showed us um, some plastic containers that they use for home gardening and pipe and other things. So in this era that we're talking about organic, 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 won't there be um, maybe when the sun heats or the environment is warm, won't some form of chemicals go into the soil and it diffuses into the plants? Then secondly, the, uh, the third speaker, she talked about these, um, I think, different kinds of plants, crops being grown. Please, I hope it's not um, grown by GMO that is genetically modified. Because as nutritionists, we should um, encourage wholesome, safe, and nutritious food. Because that is one of the things. And we know that GMO-grown foods cause a lot of health problems, including cancer and all that. That is my question. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so to answer the questions, I would like to ask uh, the members of the high table to please go back to the high table so that you can answer the question from your hand there. Okay, thank you very much. So I would give the mic to uh, the first speaker to answer the questions from uh, the other people. Thank you very much, sirs. Um, I try not to break protocol by focusing on my subject. And uh, my subject did not ask me to introduce some things. But I think some of the things we are afraid of have been dealt with. Let me start with the first question. Somebody asked soilless garden. Is this the same type of fertilizer that is used for all types of vegetables? The answer is no. Requirements are different. For example, okay, let me say we have different life cycle in vegetable production. You have the sprouting stage, you have the vegetative straight stage. Then you have the productive stage. For each stage, you need different requirements. At the sprouting stage, the plants don't need anything. What the seed needs to grow is inside the seed. So you don't need to give anything. It sprouts, it grows by itself. It has all the nutrient requirements for that in there. When you move to the vegetative stage, in terms of requirement, even light requirement and all that are quite different. So... And then when you move to the fruiting stage, you have another requirement. What we do with our type of farming is we prepare nutrients based on requirements. For example, if I'm growing lettuce, I will grow them majorly for about 30 days. They are not growing into fruiting. So I don't need to use some type of nutrient. I will only be wasting my money. But if I'm growing tomato and pepper, I focus a lot on the root zone because if they don't have a particular root size, it will affect the fruiting later on. Then when they move to the fruiting stage, we increase some nutrients. For example, look at simple magnesium sulfate. 
Magnesium it is Epsom salt. It affects the taste of vegetable. You can make your tomato sweeter. You can make your pepper sweeter by just increasing that a little. Uh, I don't want to go into theory and some difficult parts. But it's possible to determine the taste of the vegetable. And then you use different type of nutrient at these stages. But be as it may, even these problems have been solved. The way plants are designed by God, at each level, they also know what they need. If it's available in the soil or substrate, they go for it and take it. Somebody asked about fertilizer usage in the garden. Does it affect health implication and all that? Well, the particular video you were talking about is not the video I prepared. It's not my video. So let me correct that. But I think I can answer the question. I saw the video. You can't even add fertilizer to plant leaf. It will burn it. Understand that. So whatever you saw being added, mostly must be composed or something that the person is adding. As long as it does not affect the leaf at that stage, you know it's not. But it's possible to add something to affect the leaves of the vegetable. Don't get me wrong. We have systemic uh, chemicals and then we have contact. The systemic ones go through the root and the plants take them up. They stay in the plant. So that when the diseases or whatever pest comes, they attack them. Well, those that manufacture these things have it written on them that for the next seven days, you can't uh, consume this plant. Some 14 days and all that. It's more about the ethics of the grower. It's not just because, okay, if you go to the market, somebody buy beans and pour, what do you call it now? Sniper. You know that's not coming from the person that grew the plant. So it's also the ethic of the person selling it. So the, where you are from is very important. It's very important. Because they won't tell you and you may not know. But let me help us. It's possible to get rid of some of these things by using certain things to wash these vegetables before you consume them. You can wash them and it will take out those things. One of such is called hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid is the acid that our stomach produces. There are devices now, you can get them online, you can contact me, I can use you. Just using your kitchen salt and water, you, within some few minutes, you get your hypochlorous acid ready, use it to wash your vegetable before you consume it. What chemical might be in Soaking for just about 10, 15 minutes, gets it off, and then it's safe to consume. Now, thinking about some of these things, we kept asking ourselves questions. I made mention of the fact that I came in contact with a particular person that introduced a technology to me, and it, solves a lot, it solved a lot of our problem, program challenges. Now, this is a rice tech. It's a microbial inoculant. In air... Uh, microorganisms and fungi that have been fused here. When I first read about this thing, there was a time there was this oil spill, I think in the Philippines. And scientifically, they said it would take 80 years to clean the uh, ocean and all that. A Japanese scientist prepared a formula using microorganisms. And in eight years, they ate up those things, oil, heavy metal, and the water became useful again. It, it was shocking because it's an amazing thing. So when I heard that this thing can be shipped around, I met the person in charge of Africa. Incidentally, he's a Nigerian. In fact, he's there, seated there. And we met at Landmark University. And I said, What? Let's test it. Don't let us just say it can do this. Because um, it's, it has been a major game changer since then. This has not only eradicated fertilizer 
using it to prepare the soil within 30 days, you won't even need fertilizer. You won't need fertilizer. It's organic. It's edible. If I have any smell around now, let me just soak it. Because the microorganism comes alive within 8 hours. Soak it in water. Spray it there. It will disappear immediately. Immediately. So it does a lot. This has made organic... The problem we've had with organic farming is not been easy. It has not been easy. Let me say that. What you can achieve on 10 plot, you need about 20, 30. So practicability or sustainability has been the challenge. But these have solved the problem. Now, somebody also mentioned the white soilless or whatever. Let me say some of uh, the reasons for soilless. I'm a secularity proponent. And um, if you look at some of the problems we're having, let me give you an example. What we grow in the open field on 50 hectares of land, we achieve better result on one hectare using soilless farming. So if I need to kill 50 hectares of forest, I found a way to say 49 hectares using a particular technology. Now what do we use that is not soil? It's also organic. Like now, I now use rice husk. We take rice husk through pyrolysis. That you burn it at 300 degrees without oxygen. So it turns it to biochar. You get what I'm saying? And then there is a way we inoculate and do... That's our product, I'm sorry. And mix it. Before, we spent several millions to import cocoa peat. Cocoa peat is made from coconut. Currently, through him, was talking the president of coconut it's a big industry all the cocoa peat manufacturing companies in the world 90 percent are they don't grow in their soil again they grow out of soil why a lot of things you need to contend with but these are also done in what we call controlled environment agriculture you control a lot of parameters which guarantee certain result and that we've been able to do from the pictures you saw, you saw how neat these plants are. When we spray them with this, one of the things it does, it blocks off the smelling capacity of it. So even when they come around your plant, they don't see it as food, so they don't eat it. And when they stay long there, they die. Another thing, is we found trained people to understand this pest. Let me just explain to our trips. Trips are one of the biggest challenges for crows and peppers. The adult stage of trip only survive on a dusty ground. So, through our training, we let farmers know that your substrate must not be dusty. You wet it. A simple thing as mixing the soil while you are doing your daily protocol. They also survive only on the surface. A little sand on them kills them off. So some of these things we have been able to inculcate it in training. So you minimize penetration. Secondly, we are using natural means to get rid of them. So even if you have some few around, they don't see your own crop as food. And what keeps them alive is sustainability. The moment they die, they die off. Do, do you, you get what I'm trying to say? So this has helped us to solve a lot of these problems. What we are currently doing is now to make it uh, known to people. We are now making it pronounced. We are talking it to people. When we have programs, we share about it. And um, we let people know this is possible. Because technology is coming up almost every day. And it's changing the narrative of things. Somebody said, what measure have we taken to sell ideas to government? Um, I've not been in government. And I think in 2017, when we brought the idea of further production, something happened, which I cannot, uh, I cannot be a part of. So I, I don't 
really go out that way. Thank God for people like Prof that invited us to forums like this. We only share our ideas and things about this in places like this. One of the moments I've enjoyed was when I became a fellow in Ashoka. They gave us platforms beyond here. And I think it's the ripple effect that is coming back and we are getting to see now. Because at the time, I even almost gave this idea, will it last? But I now found people from outside the country and said, we saw some things you are doing, we want to support you. Let me say, I was, Ashoka was paying me US dollars not to give up on soilless farming. They did that for three years. We like your idea. A lot of people will imbibe it. Imbibe it. Keep doing it. We will be giving you stipends so that you don't have money and you, you get what I'm trying to say. So it's, it's, and we are seeing the effect now. Um, whatever we get to know about, please let's publicize it. We have social media pages where we share some of these ideas and thank you, sir. How to apply home garden in workplace and organic farming at home. Yes, some of these systems can work in your home, please. You can have it in the office. A lot of people are having them in their offices now. So, ma'am, you can, if you want to set up in your office, get in touch with me. We'll find a way to do that. And it will help you. And for daddy, managing these things, we also educate people on the type of crops or seed to use because it is important. Quality of seed has been one of the problems we have around. So really I can say, truly it's important. Some seed are no longer viable, but they are still sold in the market. So you can get that. Won't chemicals penetrate your plant from the nylon, the troughs, and all that? Well, the answer is no, they will not. We have not only tested these scrubs from the lab, we, we also work with people who are knowledgeable about some of these things, and the result has been amazing. So I think our fears have been allayed. And let me add, this type of farming is actually not about the seed. It's how you grow the seed. So it's not GMO. Uh, this technology will grow GMO. It will grow alum. It will grow hybrid. It will grow anything. It's what you bring in. But know that ethics is important. What do people believe in? Someone wants to make money. Sir, I met a young lady who got grant from three organizations. She was doing organic and some things. She said the second year she has lost 60% of her money. She wasn't getting enough. Somebody introduced her to a particular seed. She planted it and made all the money she has lost. She now told me that it's GMO. But when they are talking GMO, I will also be saying I'm doing organic. <laughs> Can you imagine? That when they say it's organic, I will say it's organic. But she said she had to tell me that I lost all my money. That so I do the I just look. So it's very important. Ethics is important. It's what we bring in. In my own organization, one major measures we put in place to correct this. That's what is called. Uh, uh, what do you uh, farming orb? In fact, it's called BIC Soilless Farm Orb. It's a orb where we different people own farms there and we work together to produce at a commercial level. I believe I've answered to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hisiejo. Thank you very much for your questions. I, I think they are quite straightforward. Um, um, there was a question about scaling up the kids' nutri garden and um, whether the government have heard about it. I think the, a forum like this is where they, they are hearing and those who are concerned are hearing about it. I mean, it's, it's to bring it to the public. You have heard um, the person from um, uh, our madam from the federal ministry is also here. NSN, um, the president, yes, huh? the federal ministry of education. So um, it's it's by coming to um, 
fora like this when we hear it and we we'll do the needful. And then the age group um, ab about children. For f right now, we deal with um, 7 to 12. Sometimes some parents bring 6-year-olds that are mature to us. The, the reason is curriculum we have developed is for this age group. So that's why I said that in introducing it to schools, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We will tailor it to the age group. Um, if we even want to teach kindergarten, it's possible. But you will bring, you will step it down. So they have their own curriculum. It's the same thing, but you will bring it to the level they can understand it. The nutrition we teach these children, we teach our university students. That's our baseline, our foundation nutrition at 200 level. So even our students who are volunteers on the program, they learn a lot because we brought down that knowledge to a very minimal something. So even a few things they didn't understand, they get to understand it at that level. And if we have to extend it to secondary schools, because uh, um, I also got a question for secondary school, it's possible. It is how we tailor the curriculum and how we align it with what currently obtains. Because from our small research that we have been asking schools, are you interested? How do we see? Who are the stakeholders? How would you like to participate? Many of the complaint is the curriculum is currently choked. Where? Where's the time? How do we fit it in? So these are where we need to think outside the box of what to do. The nutrition clubs are good. If we can come into nutrition clubs, I'm sure we'll be able to do something. So, but we can think outside the box. Nothing is impossible once we put our heart to it. So it's possible. Um, workplace, I think it's a good idea, Ma. I mean, we can start guarding anywhere so that we are sufficient. Uh, sir, you agree with me? Yes, because someone was even discussing with me, I think Dr. Aria, about the state secretariat in Ibadan that we should come and train them on doing gardening, even around the secretariat. So it's, it's, it's innovative and it's good for us to do that. Um, good planting materials. It's critical. I, I, share, I told you that this year we had, we had that challenge in Kids Nutri Garden. Someone referred us, well, that person is supposed to be an expert, We'll collect the seed, buy the seeds from so so place, and we went there. But we saw that our vegetables didn't do as well as they did the previous years. And in those years, we just went to the market. There's someone that sells seeds, and the vegetables we buy from them very good. But this one didn't turn out well. So, but that was an indication to us that we must mind where we get our seeds and other inputs. Those are very important. Um, how can we extend it? Okay, I've said that. The government. Okay, so that's, that's, that's about it. For the growing materials, we use compost that is donated, organic compost that is donated, or even from our UI teaching and research farm. We get compost from there and they give us to grow our, our, our crops. So um, it's a good initiative and anything is possible. So we will just tailor it to everybody's um, situation and need. So so that will ensure sustainability at the end of the day, so that whoever takes it up, they, they will fit it to their own um, situation, to their own environment, so that they can flow with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hedjo. Um, I want to believe we've had a long day. Okay, you have a... Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, to answer that question on GMO, I would like to ask or explain what GMOs are in relation to what we have in terms of orange flesh, sweet potato, vitamin A, cassava, and vitamins. Now, when a crop does not have, for example, is not rich in, let's say, protein, and then you have another crop that is rich in protein. Let's take beans, for example. It's high in protein. Um, cassava is not high in protein. And you want cassava to be high in protein. Then the, the, the process of taking protein from one crop and creating it into another is 
seed of another, and then as we have we have high protein. So if you take protein from beans and you infuse it into cassava, you have come up with a cassava that is high in protein. That is GMO. What we have has to do with and I like to explain it this way. If we have, if you have two, um, if you have a couple and they are both dark and eventually they give birth to maybe an albino, would you say those couples are GMOs? No. They are, that is conventional, traditional um, um, work. So conventional breeding is what gave to the biofortified crops. And so, you know that they are, the, the seeds are grown and they can be regrown. For GMO, you have to go back to the laboratory and infuse it again to get that seed that you can grow. So, in the same way we have yellow yam, we have white yam. The same way we have different varieties of beans. The same way we have different varieties of uh, tomatoes or whatever. And they are not GMO. These are the same way that this uh, biofortified or high nutrient dense crops have been made. and so you find out that you you grow um cassava you grow sweet potato for example the breeders grow and then they select and analyze and find out those that have um high maybe we are looking at vitamin as a trait and then they cross them with the following year with another one that has um another level of vitamin here and so they keep crossing and building this nutrient in that crop until it gets to a level where the content of that crop is able to, is high enough to meet health needs. And so we say that they have been biofortified. So there is no GMO at all in the biofortified crops that we have in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Okay. So we've spent quite a long time since morning and I want to believe we've had a great time, right? Shall we put our hands together for all the speakers, please? To do the vote of thanks, uh, close of, vote of thanks and closing, uh, I would like to call the project lead for Project Enan and the immediate past president of the Nutrition Society of Nigeria, Dr. B.I.C. Bry. Can we put our hands together for him? To, we've uh, sat down here for quite a while. I will just make uh, one or two quick remarks and uh, I will hand over the mic to the media past president of the NSN. We, I want to first of all thank uh, the organizers of this occasion, this event, and uh, those who have stood behind uh, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning and uh, the Nutrition Society of Nigeria to ensure that this event is successful. One or two quick uh, remarks and uh, I want to comment briefly on the issue of uh, the GMOs. Uh, please, we, if you look at indices on starvation and malnutrition Nigeria. Uh, the issue of GMOs is important. But at this stage, when people are struggling to have Nigerians to eat, we are not too keen about a science that has not established facts about an issue. So um, 
when uh, people are trying to promote home gardening. The issue of GMO should not be our concern here. It should be, uh, our concern here should be that are Nigerians having enough to eat? And, uh, I just want to make that quick comment. And, uh, uh, Mr. Debo is out, but uh, Ricky asked an, uh, a question about whether these things can be done in offices. You see, uh, in Japan, uh, about 30 years ago or so, the Japanese diet, by the way, when you hear about the Japanese diet, it's not what the Japanese eat, oh, it is it's the Japanese parliament. The Japanese parliament passed a bill mandating everybody who employed up to four people in their office to have a veranda garden. If you go to Japan, the space, the population is high, but the space is very small. So, uh, and scientists began to see that it was not possible to grow enough vegetables to meet the micronutrient requirements of the Japanese people. So if you go to Japan today, you will see that on corridors, of uh, offices they are growing tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and so on there is a horticultural authority in japan that has been mandated by law to go around offices and ensure that this law is enforced so it can be done in nigeria we are talking about diminishing land resources and we are talking about everybody feeding themselves. But now, coming to the issue of uh, uh, disease and safety versus uh, crop protection, you remember about four to five years ago, there was a tomato crisis here in Nigeria. Do you remember that? And it was caused by an insect called Tuta absoluta, or the South African leaf miner it actually wiped out the tomato crop in Nigeria. And the, what I'm about to say is very sad. Uh, Dr. Motola raised the issue of planting material. There is an authority called the National Seed Council that is supposed to enforce the question of seed. I have read through the documents. And the law says that if you sell what you have branded as seed, and it is not the, the certified seed, you go to jail for three years. But nobody knows about that. It is not being enforced. Coming back to the issue of crop protection, you see, there are local solutions to crop protection in gardens. I was in just when this tomato crisis started. And the lady manufactured a local solution. One of the things was putting a certain type of light around plants at night. In the morning, you will see that all the insects will aggregate around that light. And they are killed. Somebody also made, uh, a, a brought a biosolution by mixing some leaves. But the sad thing is that I don't know whether the Ministry of Agriculture is here. But what we had was that some people imported a lot of chemicals to try and solve these problems. And they, they fought very hard to ensure that that local biosolution was not brought to the light. I think there are moral issues uh, when we want to both promote agriculture and uh, enhance nutrition. And uh, advocates here should bear this in mind. If we are bringing solutions that will help the Nigerian masses, there are people who are getting pecuniary benefits from these local solutions. 
and they will sit on these solutions and ensure that they don't see the light of the day. This is not a good thing. Uh, I have been involved in uh, vegetable farming for many years. Uh, primarily, I'm a rice farmer. And uh, I have actually zeroed in on producing rice seeds. I buy the germ material and I produce what is called certified seeds. One kilogram of germ material is 1,800 naira which I buy. And I sell the certified seed for 700 naira per kilogram. This can be applied to uh, vegetable seeds. And uh, you will not have anyone uh, giving to you uh, seeds that will produce tomatoes that look like carrots. So uh, with these uh, few remarks, I want to hand over uh, this microphone again to uh, Dr. Bry, the IPP of the NSN, for the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, let me start by thanking God for making today a reality in our lives and enabling us to have this program. We are grateful to the Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning for leading the process and for ensuring that the Nutrition Week is held every year. So on behalf of the Society, I want to thank the Deputy Director in Charge of Nutrition, Mrs. Chito Nelson, for the work she is doing. Thank you very much, Madam. I also want to appreciate all the stakeholders in nutrition who found time to be with us here today. And also, in one way or the other, have been supporting the Nutrition Week since we started um, this week. Um, I would have spoken to outsiders. I would have started with my home by thanking the president of NSN, Professor Wasiu Afolabi, who has permitted, supported, that this public lecture, which is an activity other project, ENAN, should be incorporated into the 2021 Nutrition Week. So we are grateful. Thank you very much. Then you will notice that we have different categories of people in this hall. But let me start by thanking some of the elders who are present here, represented by Dr. Bidio Motola, a fellow of the Nutrition Society of Nigeria. Thank you so much for coming. And then there's one quiet man, the Vice President North, very hardworking. Nobody has mentioned his name. He has been working even here. Dr. Salisu Abubakar, thank you very much. Although you are part of the NN team, I appreciate the good work um, you are doing. Um, time will fail to start calling everybody one by one. And are they here? You see in the hall, LCT chapter. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In behind the scene, uh, helping us, you know, we are not in Abuja. They have been working with the budget and planning people to ensure that this program is held today. We are grateful. Thank you for all you have done. And to all the participants, I want to say a big thank you to you all. The teachers particularly, because we expect them to take this message to their schools. Teachers, well, I'm rewarding you now. They used to tell you reward is in heaven. 
I've started giving you the reward here. Thank you very much. What you receive? Thank you. And you are happy. And the students who have time to come to, we are grateful to you. Now, our guest speaker or speakers, Dr. Isiejo. This kid here, this kid, she's a kid. Oh, are you not a kid? You came to represent your group. Am I lying? Kid, thank you very much. You see, you have opened our eyes to great possibilities in our homes, in our schools. And even somebody say now we should extend it to workplace. Thank you so much. I have a problem because I don't. I should thank Mr. Debo on Ophora. Because already I'm trying to contact my, my lawyer. Okay, you see what you have. Well, I hope it's not the farmer registered with CAC that we are now. No, no, I need to. I need to call my lawyer to speak with you on this. BIC farm. You see, I'm a big man. No, I'm farm. Representing my farm here. Thank you very much. Now that you know that I'm BIC, automatically I'm a shareholder. We will meet to discuss the percentage. You have opened our eyes to, to many things, not only really as um, nutritionists, but as parents. I was happy when I had a song with you. Small boy, but at this stage, he's already a big boy. We can learn so much from, from this. Thank you so much for finding time to talk to us and not hiding certain things from us. You have exposed many things that you do. And I'm sure some farmers already imagine this place. Oh, oh God, you can see somebody's land, though. If they catch you, don't say NSF brought you to this. You see your house, oh. If you're in your landlord's house and you frowns at it, you can use your follow. <laughs> On that note, I want to thank everyone once more. Ah, my big, my big brothers and sisters in the um, in budget are planning that are working with uh, Mrs. Nelsie. Christy, is it? She? Thank you for the good work. Talk back. Oh, thank you for the good work. Thank you for the good work. Those are the names I'm familiar with, but the rest of you can appreciate So on this note, on behalf of Project Enan, Nutrition Society of Nigeria, Bill and Melida Gates Foundation, because without them we can't be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bry. Uh, so we have come to the end of this public lecture today. Uh, there will be We'll photograph for the people on the high table. Teachers, please, teachers and students, please, we encourage you to kindly wait behind here. Uh, the people from the Project on National Planning would like to see you. And the FCT chapter as well, NSN FCT chapter, please, you can also kindly wait behind so that the president can meet with you. If you are interested in the book by Mr. Adebo Ali Onofora, please, you can meet with them at the back. They have the book for a thousand naira. Thank you very much, everyone. And we wish you a journey message back to your location and destination. Thank you.
teachers and students, please kindly come forward.